Oh, I was told there wasn't going to be a microphone. Um, my, my name's Robin Percival, and I'm very happy to welcome you here today on behalf of, I better get this right or I'm in trouble, with, of the Bloody Sunday Trust and the Pat Panookin Centre, who are jointly sponsoring this 50th uh, anniversary of the re publication of the Widgery Report. We're going to start very briefly with, a, a, I think, a 10-minute film, which tells the story of the 50th anniversary, which took place in January of this year. After that, I will invite you at the end of the meeting to get a copy of this pamphlet, which is a souvenir of the 50th anniversary and it'll guarantee to go up in price as we move to the 60th and the 70th anniversary. And then we will follow with Amanda Ferguson, who's chairing this discussion um, about the Widgery Report. So that's it, folks. So sit back. I won't say enjoy, but learn. <laughs> My name is Tony Doherty. I'm the chairperson of the Bloody Sunday Trust in Derry. Uh, we have just successfully delivered a series of high profile events to mark the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and to celebrate the, the resilience and the achievements of the Bloody Sunday families over that 50 years. A number of things we set out to do uh, in the context of the 50th anniversary. One was to be particular in terms of how we commemorated the, the, the massacre uh, of the innocent people that day. And the hour was to be mindful of the full spectrum of loss that has taken place during the course of the conflict um, over the last 50 years. We were also very um, mindful of the need to be inclusive of the views of the families, to involve the families in the events uh, where they felt capable and, and comfortable in, in, in doing so. And uh, we were also very, very mindful of the, the, the passing of the generations and the fact that the, the Bloody Sunday families now mean hundreds of people, uh, as in grandsons and grand, granddaughters, nieces and nephews, uh, and, and, and so on. So we had a full series of, of considerations to, to, uh, to, to think about. protesters were gunned down on the streets, shot as they fled marauding soldiers intent on killing, shot in the back as they ran, shot as they tried to crawl to safety, shot as they lay wounded on that cold ground on that day. We remember them and those tragic events, not simply as history on a page, but as part of the living memory of so many of the people of this city and indeed of this island. Hello, my name is Declan McLaughlin. I'm the events coordinator with the Bloody Sunday Trust. And between the 13th and the 30th of January this year, we ran 27 events to cover the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. I think because of the significance of Bloody Sunday, not just locally, but right across the island, it is important to, to, to commemorate events like this, especially because of the ongoing nature of it. To me, one of the highlights of the weekend was the, the Damien Dempsey concert in the Forum, because it brought together people from all over the island uh, and, you know, in one act of, of commemorating. My name is Caroline O'Donnell. I am the daughter of Patrick O'Donnell, who was shot wounded on Bloody Sunday. My father was 41 years old at the time, and I was 14. The march, the, the rewritten of the march on the day of Bloody Sunday, I think was the saddest for me. I kept putting myself back to 1972 and thinking my father was on this. Um, and what actually happened at the end of the march was just absolutely tragic for Derry. We, I suppose, were very blessed that my father got to come home 
Um, we were one of the lucky families. It's just so fantastic that the young people now really are asking questions and really want to know what happened on the day. I'm David Latimer, Minister of First Dairy Presbyterian Church, which is located on the walls just above where the Bloody Sunday Memorial is situated in the Bogside. The only way forward is, is by uh, moving closer together so that we can listen to each other's stories. And, and as we listen to those stories and pick up the real uh, facts about what has happened within both our communities, well, I think that's, that's the beginning of something that can allow the sun to shine through the clouds and enable us to see that we will keep on moving forward together. My name is Kira O'Connor Pozo and I'm on the events team for the Bully Sunday Trust. Um, the Beyond the Silence event was emceed by Adrian Dunbar and we had the Colm Kill Ladies Choir singing um, some beautiful songs and we had um, actresses Rona Gallagher and Jamie Lee O'Donnell perform a specially written piece to pay tribute to the Bloody Sunday victims and all the victims of the conflict. Um, and that piece was made up of a curated selection of pieces of writing sent in by people from all over the city and beyond to mark the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. And it was a very moving and beautiful event. My name's Ashley Doherty. My granddad's Patrick Doherty, who was killed on Bloody Sunday. And I got to take part in the 50th um, anniversary. I got read the names out of the my name form. It was a great honor. Uh, me and my family were very proud that I got to do it. I guess we met all the in the cultural and just pantas a hashpins don don fabul just pantas the one in the Shepard Finucane Centre. Brogi na Niberty, Brogi the Dini Kailu, her na Blendi. I guess we on Semig Dini on, we on Skafja on. I guess just talking about the Tigerji awards in the year, her Lena grew, her Hill Dini grew she on a Kuaktak. I guess you see her about Tower Tak grew she. If you mean the Sasta grew grew she Lenya. As the son of somebody who was murdered on Bloody Sunday 50 years ago, and I've grown up with it all, all my life, uh, I'm now surrounded by sons and daughters, uh, nieces and nephews, grand, uh, grandsons and, and granddaughters. So we have very mindfully begun to pass on the baton of uh, dignified remembrance and the, the, the legacy of truth and justice um, that needs to continue. and uh, welcome to today's event uh, from Widgeridge Impunity. My name is Amanda Ferguson and I'm going to be the chair uh, for today's proceedings. So uh, thank you to the Bloody Sunday Trust and the Pat Finucane Centre for organising uh, today's event. We do have uh, people joining us online on Facebook and on YouTube. So if anybody is going to be using social media, if they could use the hashtag Bloody Sunday 50, so Bloody Sunday and then 5-0. And also you can put your uh, questions into the chat facility under the live stream and they'll come through to me to ask our panel and, and get the discussion going. So uh, I'm going to introduce you first of all to uh, my esteemed panel. We've got some uh, great experts here today uh, joining us. Beside me is uh, University of Edinburgh, Professor Christine Bell, who's an academic in the field uh, of human rights and transitional justice. Uh, beside uh, Christine um, is Gareth Pierce, a lawyer, renowned uh, lawyer, 
represented the Guildford Four, Birmingham Six, uh, Julian Assange, human rights activist, need, needs no introduction. Uh, and also beside uh, Gareth, we have Patricia Coyle, who had a key role uh, in securing a new inquiry into the events uh, of January 1972. So we want to try and make today's event as informal as possible and get a good conversation going and widen out the conversation uh, beyond, uh, you know, from widgery to impunity and everything in between. So uh, there's no silly questions. There's, there's nothing that uh, my panel won't be able to answer, as they say, looking on at me is very <laughs> sure about that. Um, we, we want it to be a, a nice sort of uh, informal conversation. So um, if inspiration strikes, put your hand up. Uh, and we have a roving mic so that we can uh, hear at the front uh, what your question is and we'll probably run out of time before we run out of questions. So I hope um, everybody's clear about what we're doing today. So uh, I'm just going to start uh, then with you, Christine. Um, you were watching the, the video there uh, intently. Just any reflections uh, on what you saw in the video and on this anniversary year? Well, I suppose, first of all, I would also like to pay tribute to the families uh, and the wider victims. Um, I've come to sort of hate the word resilience, actually, because I think people talk about making people resilient when they're not determined not to change the things that are putting pressure, so in some senses. But having said that, of course, there has been an amazing resilience, but not, not really resilience, but activism, um, pursuing of justice, not letting things go. Um, and I know, because I know quite a lot of people in this room, I know that that has a huge cost, uh, and it has a cost over many years, and the cost changes over time. Um, so just, I think that, uh, just would like to say that at the start. Um, I don't know, you were saying we had all the answers, and I think as time has gone on, and as I've looked at more and more of these inquiries, I feel I have less and less answers to offer, even to the extent of feeling, what am I doing here on this panel? Um, because, and I reread a lot of inquiries before coming here today, and I reread an article that has really influenced me, and I think is still quite a brilliant thing, written by a man called Stanley Cohen, where he talks about how governments construct their denial. And it was, it's very powerful because it talks about um, literal denial, saying this didn't really happen. And we saw literal denial in the idea that there was lots of buried gunmen somewhere that didn't really happen. Um, he talks then about sort of forms of legal denial and forms of implied denial, sort of saying, well, people kind of deserved it. And actually, one of the interesting things when I looked at this again, thinking about today, was he says, well, Lots of these arguments are illogical to go together, right? You can't say this massacre didn't happen, but these people had it coming to them, right? It doesn't, it's not logical. But actually he said that's not really the point. The point is there's a whole structure of things that creates a kind of system of denial overgoing. And actually, when I looked at the Widgery <coughs> Tribunal again, and I looked, read the report, um, in ways, it's interesting what couldn't be denied, even in what we see as a very rigged system, that there was things still couldn't be denied there. Um, but also, even when I looked then on at some of the other um, tribunals that have been since then, including up to the Ombudsman report on the um, loyalist and police collusion in South Belfast that came out very recently, to very little fanfare, actually, and very little public discussion, certainly where I was living in Scotland. Um, you see, actually, lots of the layers of these denial, even in reports that we think maybe did quite a good job in many ways. Um, so I think it has made me just feel it is very hard to... Why do we sort of expect a state that did these things to um, what do we what do we understand accountability is? What does it look like? What would it look like if it was delivered? And how is it that we expect um, the state really to hold itself to account? Um, it's quite difficult to understand how a state and a government does that, um, and it has quite de depressed me in ways looking at the Hillsborough tribunal even when there was so much less at stake in admitting what went on. There was no um, territorial dispute. There was just a football match and fans killed. And yet there was such systemic 
denial and cover up, um, that it made me feel looking back, the weight of everything the families were against all along was really, really huge because you would multiply by so many levels. So I still do see a real victory in bringing things to a second uh, tribunal. I know all the faults of that tribunal and what it came out with very well. Um, but I also see a victory in people telling their own story for themselves and pushing the accountability. So even what the community is doing around the 50th anniversary to me is, is creating a, a form of justice as well, even if that is not the legal justice that people have wanted and seen. So, so that's mm -hmm. kind of the, the pessimism of what you're talking about is, is directed to the state and the light and the optimism you have comes from the families? Well, yeah, very much so, yeah. yeah. It is. And, and Gareth, have you any opening reflections that you wanted to, to share with us? Well, sim similarly, um, it was the <coughs> heroic stamina of the families for approximately 40 years from, from the terrible time to the Savile Inquiry findings. Um, that's the shining light. Um, but the facts were always there. The facts were the same. It was the political convenience that shifted. And because we're looking at the role somewhat of, of what Widgery did or didn't do, um, he played his part. Um, he played his part in a, in a truly terrible way and reinforced what happened, giving it the stamp of the judiciary. Um, but where do, you, where do you start to analyze what happened? I think probably, which we may be exploring, I think, is that there are um, international obligations that are meant to be binding. It shouldn't be a matter of choice for governments or judges. Witchery was <coughs> as aware as anyone um, of what had been legislated for, adopted internationally after World War II. Um, but that was pushed to one side, and that's the repetitive history, and Britain is party to that repetitive avoiding um, of international obligations. And, and that's precisely what everybody here, I think, knows considerably better, is, is what we're going to discuss today, is what is there to hang on to that's inalienable and enforceable and, and why hasn't it been? So, you know, thank you for the opportunity of thinking about thank it. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, and Patricia? Um, <coughs> first of all, thank you for the opportunity, to, uh, the invitation to come here today. As a, as a dairy girl, I'm always delighted to get back, back home to dairy. Um, two points from the video and also from what my colleagues have said here. The, the first thing is the creation of what is described by Aoife Duffy, the academic of an apparatus of denial, a, a structure which it is, is almost impossible to break through by uh, the government in circumstances where, as, as Garth says, there's a systemic um, opposition to, 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 to letting the truth out. Um, and that apparatus of denial, I suppose I'm coming at this from a very practical perspective, having been with the families from, for six years, from 1992 to 1998, wherein the, the, the first step was the hunt for information, which I'm sure everybody <laughs> remembers well, when, when there was little money to do it, uh, but when, where there was a burning thirst on the, on the part of the families to, to get access to information over and above, obviously, what was in the public domain. And it was really qu quite uh, shocking and disgraceful, the, the, the lack of information in the public domain uh, up to that point, up until 1992 onwards, and that's six years of, of 
seeking out the information. <coughs> if one looks at one and I went back this week and had a look at it. It's 48 pages long. It was published within uh, 10 weeks. So the, the, the inquiry sat, heard evidence, and was published within 10 weeks of the events of Bloody Sunday. It involved evidence from 114 witnesses, of which quite to this day, quite astoundingly, uh, only 30 were civilian witnesses uh, in circumstances where it was held outside of Derry in Corwain. So the entire choreography and um, the, 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 the deliberate bias, which we now know exists because of the Heath Widgery fireside chat memo, which was unearthed by uh, Jane Winter, British Irish Rights Watch, around about 1994. The entire, entire apparatus was set up to retain the reputation of commas of the army and ergo the state, and, and to ensure that, that, that there was no truth in, 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 in terms of Widgery's conclusions. Although I, I do appreciate what Christine is saying, which is that you know, he did, it, it, and what Garth said is that the evidence didn't change. What changed was the extent of the evidence to which the families got access to. It's a very long-winded answer. And I suppose what I'm thinking about there is, for example, in that first six years, we managed to source the original Widgery uh, transcripts, the transcripts of the actual hearings, which were in Corwain County Hall Library in a big black dusty trunk, having sat there for 20 years at that stage. And that became a critical document, or those, those transcripts became critical, because when the Kew Gardens materials were then released, there was a comparator and that was the illumination of the various statements, the various versions of statements that were provided by soldiers to the Treasury Solicitor's Department and which were effectively changed, tailored and amended and differed even in and of themselves from the evidence that was given to the Widgery Inquiry. So I suppose I don't entirely share Christine's pessimism because I think I, I can recall the extent of the journey that the families went on and, and, and the enormous victory that they achieved. I th I'm, not, I'm not aware of any other public inquiry that's been repudiated in British legal history. I don't know if maybe Garth no, can... There isn't one. No, so it speaks for itself. Okay. And this was a, a question that um, I, I was discussing earlier with uh, Paul from the Pat Finucane Centre. What would have happened if there had been a proper inquiry at the time? You know, that's a big question, but like the implications <coughs> obviously that have flowed from there not being a proper inquiry at the time. What would have happened if, if, if they'd managed to do it properly at the time? My own view yeah. of it, it would be that it would not have been possible to have a proper inquiry at the time, it's simply because of the politics of the situation which informed everything. I mean, the fireside chat memo between Widgery, which was um, a conversation which was held in advance of the setting up of the inquiry uh, between Ted Heath and Lord Widgery uh, stated, and, and I think Ted Heath says exact words where um, it must be remembered that in Northern Ireland we are fighting not just a military war, but a propaganda war. And that is the context in which this inquiry was, was, was set up. So I, um, if for my own part, I don't think it was possible to have a proper inquiry at that time. Christine, you're not in there as well. Yeah, because you mentioned you were going to ask this, and I was thinking, yeah, I, I think it's very hard to see. What, what if there had been in a different world, in a different place, a proper inquiry? Well, I mean, I think, it would have, I think it would have done nothing less than change the course of the troubles, actually. Um, it's hard to present the sort of counterfactual in these, really, but um, I think it would have, you know, if, if it would have been possible, and I shared, I shared Trisha's view, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, but um, I think it would have called into serious question the use of the army in civilian areas um, and the a kind of I think it would have called for a broader examination of what breakdown of the rule of law meant right because the rule of law is actually about the relationship between the government and its citizens and that's ultimately what was violated on that day but actually that relationship of trust between a government and its citizens creates a horizontal rule of law between people about treating each other with respect. Um, and so I think it would have been, I think even the fact that Widgery enabled 
two different communities to tell two different stories about what happened that day had a really profound effect on the horizontal relationships between each other um, in this city, but much more broadly. Um, you know, in, in some ways, that's what David Latimer was referring to, saying, well, we have to actually you know, now listen to each other's truths. Um, I think it would have changed the course of policing. I think it would have um, forced a reckoning that the way to respond to the civil rights movement was to give civil rights. Um, ultimately, some of these things happened over time, but they happened too little too late when there was too much sort of water under the bridge. Um, so it's hard, you can pin some events down, but for me, um, Bloody Sunday, um, you know, was really a sort of turning point, I think. Um, and it's a breach of trust that's really hard to go back from. Uh, and I think, it, I think it kind of affected everything, really. So if a tribunal had come in and given a proper assessment of the facts, and if it had been clear that there was some form of accountability, including possibility of prosecutions after it, um, I think that would have... And if that had been coupled with a broader assessment of how did we get here in terms of the wider political demands, then um, I do think the years of the conflict are a story of roads not taken that should have been taken, um, and, and that was one of them. Okay, well that, that kind of feeds into the, my, my next question was going to be about the legacy of the cover-up of Widgery. Yeah. Obviously, that all, f all feeds into it. Patricia? <coughs> um, so one of my colleagues there have s said that um, it's almost as if the government cannot help themselves. If one looks at Hillsborough, it was about a football match. It wasn't about, I think it was Christine said, it wasn't about jurisdiction issues or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know territory issues. But the, the same pattern of behaviour emerged in the Hillsborough inquest as emerged in Bloody Sunday. You know, you had the propaganda, you had restriction on information, you had a distortion of information. Um, on a very basic level, if one recollects, the families will rec recollect the, the, the lead paraffin test used by Widgery to uh, mm -hmm. you know, attribute uh, gun handling to, you know, to some, uh, some of the, the innocents killed. And you know, so all these sort of tricks and manipulations, it would seem, have carried on in other uh, incidents. And mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at the the work of Ian Cobain, who writes about, um, wrote a book called Cruel Britannia, about the sort of colonial uh, background of, of, of various uh, mannerisms of, 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 of the, the government in relation to, to um, other jurisdictions. And it's clear that what happened in Northern Ireland, and, and the other reason we did not have a proper inquiry, is that it was treated effectively as, as a colony. It was treated as you know, people who simply didn't know any better, which to this day, you know, still still shocks me. They, uh, and in fact, um, you know, I just think that uh, in in reality, um, people uh, or the government is incapable of being honest about these matters. And so, where that leaves us in terms of the legacy is that even to this day, some fifty years later, the, there is no. Uh, you, you know, there was an apology, obviously, uh, on the back of the Salvo report, but in relation to other incidents, there's no apology, there's no open access to information. Previously, researchers were able to find documentation in the Public Records Office um, by fluke, or uh, it was perhaps open, because, of course, we do have the schizophrenic attitude of the British government, who are architects of the Human Rights Act and many other pieces of uh, international treaties uh, uh, and pieces of law, uh, and yet they have a complete white knuckle syndrome when it comes to access and information, which may, which may put them in a, an awkward, embarrassing or difficult position. So I suppose in answer to your question, I wasn't surprised at the, the legacy proposals which came out in the command paper in July of last year. It doesn't shock me uh, as because we're now getting to a point where our courts who uh, appear to a degree to be asserting their and uh, protecting their independence um, are now uh, dealing with these cases despite the hiatus, despite the passage of time. And, and there, is an, there must be an enormous fear within the establishment uh, of, of what might come out. And uh, Gareth, you know, on that same legacy question, I know that 
Um, you've indicated uh, previously that what happens here has an impact on what happens in other jurisdictions, that whenever so a cover-up of, of, of this magnitude happens in, in one place, that it can have an impact on, on something that happens far from, from these shores? Yes, if, if, you, if you strip back, as your previous question was, what if there hadn't been? What would have been the outcome? And so you, you can, if you strip it back even further and say, you know, post World War II, we s we set up these extraordinary institutions, United Nations. We set up, we signed up for these extraordinary principles, UN Declaration of Human Rights, and all the covenants. And we, the world community, signed up to no impunity, no immunity, proper investigation, equal rights for all. The, fat the fatal error was <laughs> that it shouldn't have been the United Nations with the concept of the nation state, it should be the United Peoples. And what happened, the default position, is that it was left to nation states to implement these propositions. It was left to nation states, if we considering human rights, to decide who were humans, who had rights. And that's been the history of the world since, and the avoidance of what is there straight in front of us to be observed. And of course, that is what has happened in the British legacy since then. And you can, you can trace it all over the world. You can trace it, you know, dealing with litigation on Guantanamo and people suing the British government for their collusion because they were there when people were in stress positions or subject to extraordinary noise or uh, su subject to um, forms of torture and then said, we didn't know. They did know. These were from the north of Ireland. These, these were what prohibited by the European Courts of Human Rights, prohibited treatment. You can trace things and say, if in the early 70s, Britain had actually made it a criminal offence, investigated for use of torture such as that, would it really have condoned it in Guantanamo? Would it have been able to if it had thought that people would be punished? And, and not just individuals, not just the foot soldiers, but those, those at the top who endorsed it. But when we're grappling with all of this, we're grappling with the, how impunity breeds impunity, breeds impunity, and, and take, takes it on ad infinitum. So, you know, in, in, the, in the historic geographical context of Bloody Sunday, you could say, if there had been an investigation and prosecutions to do with Bally Murphy, would there ever have been a Bloody Sunday? You take it back and back and back, and yes, you know, Britain, Britain dealing with this um, as a colonial exercise in which it decides who is human, who has rights, who has immunity, who has impunity. It, it creates a succession for all of history. And just, uh, like I've been scribbling while you've been talking and some of the words that are sort of coming up uh, time and again are avoidance of international obligations and de denial. There's a certain theme that's happening there. No, not that we're going to fix everything today, but is there a fix for that? Is, is it, does there have to be a, a day of reckoning or an owning up to behaviours in all over the world? Because it, it doesn't seem to be that this story that's replicated in the north of Ireland or Northern Ireland, however you view this place, that people are more aware <coughs> of, of, of Britain's role internationally. Is, is, there, is there any advice for the, for the government or society on how to, how to handle that or how to deal with it or how to deal with the, the history of this place? Look, uh, 
<laughs> and it was it, a big question. It, these things aren't necessarily isolated in, in time, but they can be so concentrated in time that looking at what happened somewhere, um, you know, Bloody Sunday was one of the, perhaps the most catastrophic event in terms of of our history as a nation. But in England, it wasn't seen or understood. In Ireland, as a nation, the Republic, there was a national strike. Um, there was the ability to understand, the ability to perceive, um, but the, the narrative that was imposed, how can governments impose their narrative? How can they? But they do. Um, and it's, it's the resistance to the narrative to some extent must depend not just on you know, dedicated investigation when it's the duty, the absolute duty of a government to investigate deaths, to investigate unlawful killing brought about by, by its agencies. If, if it forfeits that and, and abandons it to civilians to carry it out instead, it's forfeiting so, something so fundamental that the whole structure of the state um, is, is corroded. So it's, it's, it's how, to, how to wind back and demonstrate that it was corroded, that it is corroded, and that something has to replace it. And as, as I understand it, that's, the, that's, that's what's being grappled with here and now is feeling that these concepts are slipping away again after such achievements. They're slipping away again and the moment is passing. But yet, yet it is a moment. Um, and when that moment passes, maybe it doesn't come again. So it is a moment of... Some cases are of, of particular significance. There was... Um, few years ago <coughs> at the um, the time of the revolution in Libya um, all of the government records were seized including all the exchanges between Libyan intelligence and MI5 and MI6 and completely damning, damning telegrams sent between to accomplish the rendition and torture of, of leading Libyan dissidents. Planes were diverted, so they'd be taken to Libya and tortured, Belhaj. There was the clearest possible evidence of the most senior people in our country, including Jack Straw, um, the, the minister at the time, and, and the head of the intelligence service, complicit in rendition and torture. And this Crown Prosecution Service balked at charging them. They didn't, they didn't charge with criminal offences. I see that as, as a moment that should have happened for this whole principle, a significant opportunity to demonstrate. And, and that, that was balked at. Um, is there any indication that that's going to change in the future? Or is there anything that gives you hope that that might be a scenario that doesn't keep repeatedly unfolding? It, it, mat it matters. It, it, it matters continuing, empowering, regenerating social movements to, to bring about, bring about um, observance of the law. Yeah. 
And, and Patricia, just uh, on that, uh, that theme, we know that um, discussions that take place in the North um, around collusion are often very difficult. Uh, they're difficult because people have different interpretations about the extent to which that was an issue in this part of the world. And you see that the, the, the politics of this place feeds in to that. Can you see us ever able to have a <coughs> mature conversation about the reality of that, as in the, the sort of the, the balance between how much of how, how much of an extent you know to what extent that unfolded in this part of the world i think um it's a really first of all it's it's, a, it's from a society point of view it's the legacy cases are still uh, quite divisive mm. however my own personal and professional view is that at the minute in light of the government's um proposals uh, the command paper from last july which sets out clearly what their motivation is, which is to close everything down here to, 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 to try to stop, you know, access to justice, which is through the inquest system, uh, criminal investigations, criminal prosecutions and civil claims. Um, it, the only um, short term approach that certainly uh, lawyers and, uh, and clients, in my view, at this stage can take is uh, the approach of an incremental approach, which is that you just keep doing what you're doing and go to the courts for redress until such times as you have to deal with um, the legislation. And just by way of example, we had a, a waterboarding case, uh, which we ran a civil action in January just of this year, where uh, members of the uh, Parachute Regiment are alleged to have waterboarded a gentleman who went to, to jail then for 18 years and subsequently ha had his convictions overturned and received compensation on the miscarriage of justice uh, compensation scheme. And that case ran just in January of this year. Now the judgment is reserved at the minute. Um, we're, we're waiting for the indication from the court. But um, uh, we have a case of a 15 year old boy who the family believes was shot by the army while walking through the grounds of the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, by one high velocity shot effectively through, you know, through the chest from a height from the, the, the buildings. Um, the army on top of the buildings uh, is what the family believe. And that inquest just opened last month in March and then adjourned for further disclosure from the Ministry of Defence who are adopting what I would describe as the white knuckle position where <laughs> you know, very little information is being distributed. Uh, we have a, a very interesting um, legacy um, proposal challenge where what we've done is we've gone to the courts in Northern Ireland with, not, I should say, not much joy so far, uh, where we've, uh, for two clients, one of whom is a brother of one of the New Lodge Six, um, and the other is a girl called Patricia Burns, whose father, Thomas Burns, who was um, himself an ex-serviceman. He was in the Navy for 10 years and then returned to his young family in Belfast. And uh, in those cases, we've gone to both the Judicial Review Court and to the Court of Appeal on appeal, um, uh, asking for, quite unusually, asking for an advisory judgment from the courts. It's only really been done once before to inform any subsequent parliamentary debate, which is quite unusual. Um, our courts are not biting at the minute. Um, we just had our, our second failure there in the Court of Appeal um, and we're now considering the merits of petitioning the, the Supreme Court on that point, basically saying to the courts here, no, you have to get involved now, or, or certainly even the court in London, uh, to prevent the, uh, any, any type of implementation of this as legislation, because I think there is a big dichotomy here. I don't believe that in England, Wales and Scotland, there is sufficient knowledge or even one might say inclination or interest, I don't know what your views on that are, about what is happening here and about the, the, the enormous consequences of, of what can happen here. So my own view, in answer to your question, my own view at the minute is, it's incremental, it's brick by brick. It's in fact doing what the bloody Sun Sunday families and women did so well, which is you take the brick, every obstacle you face, you take it down and you go. You, you just have to plow on and get to the next one and then see what your strategy is. But uh, And you did it so brilliantly and it's such a template, but also a high threshold. But from my professional point of view at the minute, that is the only way to deal with these cases. And our courts are p appear to be open to it. And if we've done nothing else, even though at this stage we've had um, two failures in our lower court and our court of appeal on the advisory judgment uh, issue, uh, we have at least delayed the implementation of this legislation because in fact it was due in last October 
which would have had obviously enormous implications for uh, any of the, even the 22 cases, the inquest, the legacy inquest, which are due to be heard here. Um, and it was uh, postponed until December, it didn't come in December, it was due to come in again in March and still hasn't come in. So I don't know if this, leg if this proposed legislation is simply going to wither on the vine because it's so outrageous and it's been so publicly and universally condemned, or if the intention is to proceed with it um, uh, quietly or to try to do it quietly at a later date, I don't know. But I'd be interested in Garth's view on, you know, because it does seem to me there is a, there is a lack, and it, it quite interestingly, that legislation, the proposals, the command paper, there's no suggestion at this stage that they are going to extend to England and Wales. And I was reading recently that the, the, the Birmingham 6 uh, investigation is ongoing, the police investigation. Mm. Uh, so so but it... No, you're right. Um, we, we, we don't know, shockingly. Yeah. Um, I learned more in the car in my lift kindly given today um, of what's going on from the airport um, than I knew. But fundamentally, Britain is bang in the middle of a breach of its international obligations, right to life, Article 2, mm. duty to investigate and prosecute. It couldn't be more central um, to what we're signed up to so um yeah mm. well so certainly when it, I mean, from a journalistic point of view when th nobody is happy with this you know if whether you're talking to uh, politicians of a unionist persuasion or republican persuasion when you're talking to ex-service people there's nobody that is is delighted that this um proposal is on the table as you said there's been sort of universal uh, condemnation of it and the idea of cutting off sort of criminal civil an inquest justice or access to those things. Uh, whenever I've been trying to, because I would do some broadcasting in Britain and so on, whenever I'm trying to reflect it, families are saying to me, it's as if our, our lives don't matter in this part of the world. So, you know, what does that do to a society? What does that does it do to the psyche of a city or to a jurisdiction or a place, whatever, whatever way you choose to describe this place? Like, how toxic is that to the, the public discourse that's, that's, that's happening? There's actually, there's, there's also, it's, it's not even just a convention rights issue, there's a really serious constitutional law issue about interference with judicial functioning, interference with independent prosecutorial functioning. It's not, you know, it's, it's not simply about uh, the, the, the courts, um, including the Supreme Court, if one looks at the Hood of Man case, not wanting effectively apply the Human Rights Convention, the, Euro the European Code of Conduct, basically. It's about the fact that they, this is a real breach of the common law. This is a breach of constitutional law, which is so fundamental and so egregious that it really, it, it really should not... I, the idea that it even would have to be debated by yeah, Parliament yeah. Is, quite, is, is quite astounding, you know? Yeah. So. Um, we're going to uh, move to the to audience questions now, so get, get your hands up, get ready to, to ask our panel some questions. And again, if you're joining us online, uh, you can put questions into the chat facility uh, to, to get them across to our panel today. So I appreciate there's a, a broad wealth of experience here and people of different perspectives, and we're, we're open to hear all of those. So if you have a particular question that you would like a particular panelist to address, um, just say that. So if anybody wants to go first, Anyone at all? Yes, you can, yeah. what they've been doing, which is the intelligence services. And we know what the paras did. I mean, they may not, um, they may not have received justice, um, you know, but we do know what the RUC, um, the army, et cetera, et cetera, did. The one people we don't really know what they were up to was the intelligence services. And that seems to be the hardest one not to crack, to get information about what they were up to. 
Well, that's um, that's British national vice. One of the, but a, a major national vice is secrecy, more than any other comparable democratic state, in fact, and and the 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 false premise on which it's constructed and adopted is that the state is our protector and the state determines what's needed to protect us and part of that is secrets and we therefore have to defer consideration of national security to the state and we defer knowledge of what goes on and, uh, and not just that is um, why much less is is revealed in this country than, you know, for instance, the United States about what happened. All we still still hang on. We constitute um, secretive um, overseas bodies, intelligence, security committee members, grandees from the House of Commons, House of Lords. We never know what they. We never know what their findings are. Um, they're kept from us. It, it, it's an extraordinary and appalling syndrome, and it's getting worse. We erect more and more secret courts. Mm -hmm. We subject people, we deprive people of nationality, British nationality, and then it's heard in a secret court. Um, even civil, civil litigation, all the Guantanamo litigation, they, they negotiated and settled the claims when they were having to disclose things. Then they said it should be heard in a secret court. They lost that. And then Parliament reversed it and introduced secret courts for civil actions. So you could sue the security service for the most terrible things done to you, lose the case, never know why you lost it, maybe win, never know why you'd won. It's an, a, a complete reversal of the whole principles of justice. But that, that, is, that is not just how we, how we progress, it's how we increase and develop a subservience to so-called national security for so-called reasons of necessary secrecy. Okay, thank you. We've got another question just in the middle there, if you want to... There was some strategic uh, planning in relation to it, um, and obviously it was quite far-sighted when one looks at it now. But if w if you look at the judgment um, by Mr. Justice O'Hara from the the prosecution last year, where clearly states these statements to the Royal Military Police were not voluntary; they didn't get legal advice; they were under duress from their senior officers, etc. When you look at that through the prism of history, it was it. it I have to say, I, my own view would be that from a strategic point of view, there was some far uh, reaching um, or, or f foresight that um, to provide statements in that manner would be uh, to um, ensure that they could not be uh, or may not may not be rendered admissible in other court forums or, or proceedings so so yes I think you're right about that okay thank you um, um, I have a question for Christine um, I took evidence on Monday following Bloody Sunday and I attended a few of the Widgery Tribunal here at the way the
um, whole proceedings were taking place, and it was quite obvious that widgery was coming out. But my question, with a complete whitewash, but my question for you is, and I still do not understand it, how was it possible for a Lord Chief Justice to avoid so many witness statements in terms of writing his report? That led to me to believe that there was no rule of law within the British state. And I've ever since then been writing about the rule of law. But can you explain, you teach um, young lawyers, how is it that a Lord Chief Justice could produce a report like that and get away with it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, it wasn't, a, it was a very bad process and it was a process that had a political end. Um, it was, I, I tried to write down some bits and I may not have written down the bits, but I mean, it was, you know, he, he used these mechanisms of denial, I think, to say why he didn't need to call. There's all these reasons why he says he doesn't need to call lots of people. Um, so, but there's also built-in language that indicates from the get-go his assumptions of what it is he's doing and the conclusions that he's coming to. So, um, you know, my sense is the fireside chats had had, had an impact, <laughs> you know, and uh, if you want to get to a certain result, you do things a certain way, and if you start to do them a more straightforward way, uh, you know, you, you leave open the possibility of, of what your findings might be, and clearly uh, that wasn't the approach taken. Um, <coughs> I wonder, can you, you oh, mean, is it, is it, when I was, I wasn't trying, I was just looking back, back on it and going, even with all the way the forensics were done, um, they still couldn't even pin any forensics, even in this corrupt way, on certain, you know, they, they couldn't even sustain that across all the victims. And actually, there's this phrase, it's really, I'll just read it out. I mean, I'm sure you all know it much better than me, but um, there's, it talks about, um, at one end of the scale, some soldiers showed a high degree of responsibility. At the other, um, notably in Glenfada Park, firing bordered on the reckless. And then, but then he says, these distinctions reflect, and this passive voice, right? differences in the character and temperament of the soldiers concerned. So there's not a, but it's interesting that even on, with all the problems you're saying, there still has to be acknowledgement that there was recklessness there in the shooting. Now I'm not saying that makes it okay, but I'm just saying that even with everything weighted, it was impossible to say everything was hunky-dory that day from the army point of view. Um, so, once you get too many witnesses, and once you, I think also the more you put a range of people on the stand and open it up to forms of cross-examination, it's actually quite difficult to sustain lies. Um, I, I've seen cases in court where police systematically have lied about a situation, and the only really way that it's been able to be sustained was with just repeating the one statement over and over again. You know, maybe eight police officers in a row doing that. So, because once you start to give context and say things, people um, trip themselves up, um, in my experience. So, yeah, so I mean, but there's lots, lots of things since then as well, I can't answer, okay. that haven't been done very well. Okay, yeah, um, we're if I may just, because yeah, yeah. that's a really interesting question. So. Widgery received, as I understand it, the families have put me right, um, 700 statements. He says he receives them late in the day at an advanced stage. Of course, that would really make no difference to any court forum. Um, he then calls only 30, if not included in that, the priests. I think there were about six priests as well, so about 36 people. It, interestingly, when Savo was interviewed um, on the anniversary in January, um, he said that... the. F from his perspective, the reason why Jury got it completely wrong is because he disregarded the civilian evidence. So, um, he, 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 you know, one wonders, did he even look at the other 600-odd statements? Um, but that, to my mind, that, that point on its own was an enough to fundamentally flaw 
the, the Widgery inquiry from, from the get-go, it was just so completely skewed um, that it, it really was a, a house of cards, you know. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a couple of questions from online and then we'll, we'll go back to the audience. Um, one question that's come in is, could the panel uh, talk more about legacy cases on an international level and how they compare to legacy cases here in the north, uh, e.g. Pinochet re regime and others? Who wants to take this one, Gareth? Do you? <laughs> I can talk about something slightly different, um, which is the, ho the same question of what if something isn't done right or isn't followed. Um, um, maybe 20 years ago, I, uh, it was post 20 thousand um i t i t took a case is it in the european court of human rights against russia um on behalf of s bereaved families and survivors in chechnya who've been subjected to the carpet bombing of grozny um, by russian forces and Gro grozny wiped out deliberately and doctors and nurses who've been operating in a basement given a humanitarian passage out and then were torn off the bus and tortured, raped, um, detained in villages around Grozny, civilians shot, killed. And those cases succeeded in Strasbourg, but Russia paid the compensation, but didn't change its systemic practices, which was the intention. And then a similar case years later in Syria, Russians party with Syria to carpet bombing Aleppo, and now Ukraine, exactly the same. And you think, if the Chechen cases had stopped them, if there had been some international reckoning protest, if the Aleppo doctor's case had stopped them, could U Ukraine ha be happening? And, and as well as that consciousness that Putin is doing the same again and again and again, but also the consciousness that the rest of the world did not protest in the way it's protesting to an extent about Ukraine. And Muslims in Britain and probably all over the world are saying, we protested about Chechnya. We protested about Aleppo. Why did nobody join us in our protest? And and so these, you know, these lessons of, of how impunity breeds impunity internationally um, must cause us to think. You know, we, we do not, we collectively do not even enforce, attempt to enforce the obligations and the betraying. Um, they're just sickening echoes. Thank you for that, Gareth. Do you want to say something, I mean, Christine? There have been a lot of changes over the last sort of 20 years or so in terms of international stances. So in the early 1990s, when there were peace processes, it was quite routine for people to just amnesty each other. Um, and over time, there's been more of an acceptance that there needs to be, that you know, you need to have human rights in the transition and peace process itself, uh, and that that's not an acceptable way. There have been other th things that have changed. For example, the establishment of the International Criminal Court, which in some senses had been thought of at the time of the Nuremberg trials. Let's have a permanent International Criminal Court. But there's a lot of obstacles, you know, legal, technical ones and political ones to bringing cases before, um, before the court. That said, you know, there are, 
Um, I suppose what you can see is things change over time, and there's two um, interesting things. You know, that first of all, some very senior people have been held accountable uh, through the criminal court, although lots of other people that we think should be responsible haven't. Um, but the second development I think is more interesting is in Latin America, where there were systems of impunity in the early 1990s, um, and where there was a big internationalization um, and you know, attempt to take things to international courts. Actually, years and years later, um, domestic courts have changed their position, and I suppose this has a bit of late justice. Um, but for sort of complicated political reasons within countries, um, including Chile, um, domestic courts have started to reopen amnesties and things that were long settled um, and allow cases to court and, and find findings and, and overrule um, the types of um, impunity and guarantee around evidence um, that, that you were talking about. Um, and it's quite interesting because it hasn't uh, really been driven by you know lots of international lawyers coming in um, and doing stuff from outside. It's very much been domestically driven and a change in the stance of the justice system. And it's linked, interestingly, also to renewal of constitutions a little bit um, to sort of try to embed human rights a bit more strongly. And I think some of that is quite interesting and hopeful. So, and it's probably, in ways, one of the lessons of Bloody Sunday as well, that, um, that different forms of justice are, are possible over different time periods. You know, and this is why I think involvement of future generations is really important, because things do change. The politics around you does change, and there become moments in which new th there are new hurdles to be opened up, but sometimes there's new lines of argument. So the Human Rights Act itself, which was in part also something that came about because of the peace process and it had other bits to it as reasons for it as well it came about because of sort of social movements in england um, pushing for human rights as well um, but that you know created new remedies in domestic courts that weren't available up until um up until the late 1990s and 2000 so there are changes over time then you do get new forms of pushback, you know, so there is a sort of this continuing push and counter push goes back, new forms of obstacle um, and, and new um, brought up. So, you know, I'm sort of hopeful you, you're saying, well, maybe the legacy bill, you know, just withers away and um, that may be dependent on the fate of this particular government, which hangs a bit in the balance at the minute, um, you know, but there's also a worrying move to dismantle the Human Rights Act itself. Mm -hmm. um, so is that maybe stalling to say, well, let's, you know, if we just bring the legacy bill in, we actually, you know, shut down domestic remedies, but we create a do not pass go, do not collect 200 route to the European court. Um, so, you know, are they, is it withering away because it was such a bad idea? Or are they trying to reduce access to the European Court <laughs> first? You wouldn't really know at this no, point. It's, it's, um, di it's mm -hmm. difficult. And I think it's also not possible to, I think we can over, um, I think there's a, there's a sort of instinct driving the government rather than a coherent. Don't, don't really work. From their point of view, they've become quite hard to implement, and, and Brexit itself is quite a good example, um, because they're not really very coherent proposals. But that is not to say that there's a there's a sort of deep instinct that drives them. Um, that is actually, I think, quite different from there's been for a long time, and I think that is an instinct um, of a move towards a much much more authoritarian form of government than we have seen or known. And I think that's for that's the moment that we're in right here and now. Uh, and I think it's a very disturbing and troubling moment. Um, and in ways, you know, that makes the work that Patricia, the work that the Trust and, and Pat Finnegan Centre are doing um, really important. Um, but it also maybe means that the new alliances are possible around that type of justice work. Um, because I think I think human rights generally are really, really, really on the line. 
even though, and in some ways maybe it's a bit of a reaction to some of the progress that there's been um, on a lot of fronts. Um, so, I mean, the problem is these fights have to constantly be refought and rewon, and they're run and they create new games, which then have to be re-engaged with and refought and won. Okay, thank you. Guess, do you want to say something there? Or are you just staring intently? Right. The, another question has come in. Uh, what lessons can we learn from Widgery as we look at dealing with miscarriages of justice in UK law since then? Online. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, Widgery did um, did a number of things, not not um, not confined to Bloody Sunday. Um, I can think of many cases where he carried on carrying on, um, keeping people in prison who were innocent. Um, but looking, you know. It is necessary to look at what he wrote and to look at his mindset or what he was there to do and how he did it. But one can focus on him, but then stand back and look, you know, look at what else cases, cases that people here know about. There were 18 very senior judges all contributed to keeping the Birmingham Six in prison for 16 years. And it wasn't just widgery, it was, they all, they all saw it as their job um, to act against the evidence. Um, um, and as an arm of political repression, that, that's what was done, and that hasn't totally disappeared. Um, it, you know, it's a, I was asked by a judge quite recently, what do you think of judges? And um, <laughs> I, I, I said that, I thought it was really wrong that one commented on a judge's fairness. If a judge was fair, it was something that those who experienced that would comment on. Um, it shouldn't be like that as something distinct from the norm that you observed. But, but what I did say is that a judge, a judge doing something unfair is the most serious and terrible thing. It, it's an exercise of arbitrary power and its consequences can be si simply enormous and unstoppable. And um, Widgery and his report played that part in it, but he wasn't alone, and his fellow brethren judges were not criticizing him at the time. You know, he was not subject to peer group review. Um, and and um, so a fair judge should be the norm. Do you want to add anything to I that? was just going to pick up on two points. Um, <coughs> the first thing is what Robin said. I think one of the reasons judicial scrutiny is so important in these cases is because f intelligence material needs to be authenticated. And, that, and that, that's a serious issue when you're dealing with collusion. So the absence of I th these proposals at the minute are suggesting some type of desktop review, which is really nonsense. And the reason in particular that it's nonsense is because there is no mechanism for authentication then to say wh what is the genesis of that document, who wrote it, when was, writ was it written, you know, can to what degree is it accurate? Th that's a big issue with these proposals that, that if you th then stray into, if the cases um, that are being reviewed in Verticom is then deal with collusion issues, w to what degree can you believe what is the truth and what is not? The second issue is that uh, reflecting on the 
um, the, the video at the beginning, the short film, um, Tony mentioned, and I, I think this is really compelling, the, the fact that this is, no, this is not diminishing, that the sheer will and thirst for justice is not being driven by lawyers particularly, it is being driven by family members and relatives. And I think the government does well not to forget that because you know we're in a situation where this is intergenerational now. You are passing on uh, the baton to younger people in your family, you know, to sons and daughters and grandchildren. And, and so this is not something which is simply going to disappear uh, as the government would probably like it to uh, at present or certain elements of the government. And I suppose the third thing is the, the other lesson from Widgery is, you know, there's no harm in failing as long as you get up and try again. Because, for example, yes. the Bloody Sunday families did an application to Europe back in before the Human Rights Act came in. Um, they applied um, for, uh, John Major had written a letter saying that the families should consider their loved ones innocent of any wrongdoing. On the back of that, uh, we said there was a new time limit. and <laughs> We went to Europe and of course were, were eventually, you know, um, thrown out by the collar, but were the position of the Human Rights Act. Th there was a political embarrassment element to go into the European Court in Strasbourg you know, and, and for the government, uh, and it it it, it uh, created for the family a, a forum wherein the, the the new evidence, which was available at that point, was was considered. Um, so you know, fail and then get up and feel better. You know, but do it again, but don't give up. And I think I have to say, <coughs> for my own part, the most incredible thing about what has happened, particularly in Derry, is that from a fairly despicable act of humanity, uh, you know, uh, ha what, ha what you guys have created is really, really impressive. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we have a question at the back and then I'll come forward to, to the front. The gentleman in the blue shirt at the back, if we can get the mic uh, to the gentleman at the back in the blue shirt and then we'll, we'll move forward as well. Just going back to, the, actually back to where we started and the question was actually put out, you know, if Widgery had got it right, what impact would it have had on the conflict? It would have, I, I believe it would have been massive, but I think what would have been more massive would have been the 18 minutes of madness on Rossville Street on the 30th of January. If that hadn't happened, it would have had an even bigger impact on, on, on resolving this conflict. But I've, back to Gareth, as far as Christine's point about, you know, about them, Sort of, what did we? What did they learn from Woodbury? Apparently, by 1980, uh, Lord Denning had learned an awful lot, and you turn around and create. You know, I mean, if we're going to believe the evidence is coming forward, then we create such an appalling vista. You know, I mean, as, as dism almost dismissiveness of looking at new evidence. You know, in the same way that Woodbury, the same way that Woodbury treated the original evidence. And just one other question, and you know, it's one of the things that I haven't heard talked about at all. Uh, or maybe have just missed the conversation. The derogation of the of the British government from from international convention in the nineteen seventies did that play into um, sort of the the way that justice was going to be dealt with. Britain op opting out of of international conventions. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead, Kathy. It it is it, it's constant battle. Um, with with um, the ju judiciary playing their part in in not wishing to sign up to the European Convention of Human Rights, articulating their dislike of it, their projecting of the image of British law is best and knows best, and we're not going to be told by foreigners what to do. There is that concept still alive and well. But I just mentioned one thing since you mentioned Lord Denning. Um, he he um, wrote a book, um, and in the book he wrote about a trial in Bristol in which a number of young black people, black young men, had fought against the police who were constantly harassing them, attacking them. And they were charged with riot and they were acquitted. And they had a jury which was a jury 
of white and black people. And Lord Dunning wrote in his book, these people were acquitted because they packed the jury with their own and they come from countries where truth is not known. And two, two jurors um, wrote a letter to Lord Dunning and his publisher, said we, we um, responded to our civic duty, we were summoned as jurors, um, and you've defamed us. And um, within a day, the um, publisher was on to um, the lawyer for the, the two jurors. Um, and asked what they wanted. Money, what money? Wow. And they, d they didn't want money. And at the end of the week, Lord Dunning resigned. And all of the books, copies of the book, were pulped. And so, you know, the articulation by judges, however senior, of corrosive prejudice sh shouldn't be immune. There shouldn't be impunity. Okay. Thank you for that. And um, we'll just move to this gentleman here. We're going to get you the mic in just one wee second. Thank you. I don't usually use a mic. Well, maybe so the online people can hear as well. <laughs> My you're, you're good, you go. Could I go to Miss Coyle and just pick up on something that uh, you said? You talked to, made a couple of references to the British Command paper, and it seems based on your comments, if I'm not misinterpreting you, that basically all this is is a Boris Johnson version of widgery and impunity. That basically, in the widgery report, they committed murder. They said, we'll appoint a high-level commission and investigate the facts, and everybody wait for that. And the high-level commission exonerates Britain. You know, their judge exonerated them. So therefore, nobody could say they're guilty of murder. You know, and it took a, a lot of years for uh, that to be, those families to get vindicated. And now what they want to do, we're breaking through, or people are breaking through, or relatives are breaking through on inquests. They're breaking through a little bit on civil cases. They're breaking through on ombudsman report. So let's take all of that away. And they want to have a new kind of special hearing, a desktop review or something where information retrieval. And then they can say, oh, we exonerated, won't do a discovery, won't do anything where lawyers are involved, won't do anything with the fa any of the families have any confidence in. They can exonerate Britain again like they did with Widgery and say, look, we have these hearings, we were exonerated. Only the difference is they think this time they can get away with taking everything else, as you said, that could give justice to anybody. And, and by the way, my understanding is they're gonna go through with it. It's not withering on the vine. They're just gonna wait to the proper time and, and just try and say, we've got something new that make minor changes, and then they're gonna push this through. Would that be, you know, my- Yes, that's a very succinct summary of, of the situation. And when I say wither on the vine, if they introduce this bill, it will have to go through parliamentary debate, and that's why it concerns me uh, that um, the, uh, the public in England, Wales are not um, yeah. sufficiently educated um, and, and therefore that's why we took the unusual litigation step of trying to get an advisory judgment from the courts, whether or not the Supreme Court will bite, whether we'll go there, I don't know at this stage, but you're 100% right and it is really quite, um, it's beyond words, the impact that such, the irretrievable damage that, that such uh, a bill would um, that such a bill would would, would uh, impart on the citizens of Northern Ireland, and I think I I would have some limited hope that it wouldn't get through the House of Lords, uh, because there's sufficient independent there. But I I don't know. I'm not a legislative expert. So in in answer to your question, you know, you, you first of all you put it really well. You summarised it very succinctly. Secondly, you're right, it may not wither on the vine, uh, but thirdly, it is government specific at the minute. Although, although it does, as Christine says, it comes against a backdrop of a government which, which was really ticked off by the interference um, by the Supreme Court in the Brexit uh, affair. Um, 
so has now conducted uh, one review of the Human Rights Act and two reviews of judicial review mechanisms uh, to, and to what degree the, 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 the courts can hold the executive accountable. Uh, so obviously you ha uh, the leg and the legislature. So you have a, a real constitutional power play here on this in terms of not just convention rights, uh, you have it on common law and constitutional issues in relation to what is the, is the rule of law, is, is Parliament sovereign? Is it absolute or does the rule of law apply? That's really the question. So, and, and it's, it's unfortunately I don't have a crystal ball so I can't answer it at this stage. I would welcome my colleagues' uh, views on it though. Catherine, Christine, do you wanna go next? No, you're okay. Do you have any reflections? Uh, I don't know. There, I mean, I think, yeah, I think one of the problems is also that I, I do see the Supreme Court is slightly retrenching at the minute as well, yes, particularly right. in terms of how it deals with devolution issues. There's been quite interesting cases in Scotland where um, the Scottish government actually tried to incorporate the Children's Rights Convention into domestic Scottish law um, m using a model very similar to the Human Rights Act. Um, now, it should be possible, and in fact, in the uh, Belfast or Good Friday Agreement. Um, there's a commitment, of course, to have a Bill of Rights. So it should be always possible to create a higher floor of human rights at the devolved level, whether it's Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. Um, but in fact, there's been a very sort of negative judgment um, saying that because technically it, the courts in Scotland would then get to review laws, that this um, is actually outside the power of the Scottish Government to pass this law. Um, so there's a kind of a, and I think, um, I think there were other ways for the court to make that judgment that were not quite as narrow in terms of honouring that there is a kind of um, devolved sovereignty to the Scottish Parliament in particular, partly as a result of legislation that was conceded to win um, the independence referendum, uh, really entrenched the authority of the Scottish Parliament. So I think, again, there's a sort of, there's a pressure at the minute on a lot of public institutions, and a lot of them are sort of um, backtracking a little bit. And I do see the Supreme Court as, as possibly, I mean, it will, it will have to see, but possibly a little bit in that position. Um, they have already backtracked in terms of the retrospective application of the convention rights of Article 2. Yeah. In the Hood of Man judgment, they refer to the fact that cases really only from 1990 should be considered as, as, as having, as being within the category where it should be. So that, that is already uh, going to involve other litigation. Um, but of course then, uh, one is al always left with the direct route to Europe. Um, you know, uh, if, if, um, if they do try to dismantle the Human Rights Act, but I think it's so embedded now in our jurisprudence, it would be, it would be a real dogfight, you know, to try to do that. But. Mm -hmm. And we have a question at the front here, so we'll, we'll get to you next, yep. <laughs> to put the reality to the panel that government, be it the British government or anywhere else in the world, has got one objective, and that is not to be embarrassed. And uh, the corollary to that objective is to retain power at all costs for the purposes of making sure that they are not embarrassed. Uh, Britain is no newcomer to the idea of resistance to being embarrassed. It has been embarrassed or potentially embarrassed for generations, right through the 19th century, up into the 20th century. The, the shooting of the miners in Tonopandi in 1911 is one particular case that springs to mind. And as a means to that end, the efforts of the good men who are attempting to do something about the system are quite often and regularly set at naught. And in that uh, diatribe, I include not just the British government, 
I include the American government, most of the governments in South America, most governments worldwide. We have heard today that uh, President Bolsonaro in Brazil has set aside and pardoned uh, the uh, minister, or his, his crony, who had criticised the uh, Supreme Court in Brazil and who had been imprisoned for so doing. That individual is now a free man. And coming closer to home, I have to say, and there's a particular hobby horse of mine, which is the Salins uh, robbery case, and in particular the cases of Oscar Bernach and Nikki Kelly. Now, in that case, um, the applications which were taken on behalf of Kelly and Branagh uh, were rejected out of hand by the High Court using as the basis of its rejection the obiter dicta of the appalling visita which Lord Denning used. I may seem bitter and twisted, ladies, but I fear there is a good reason for it. And while I applaud the efforts of anyone who has stood firm for the cause of justice and righteousness, I have to say there is a very, very hard road ahead. Nevertheless, let it prosper. Okay. <laughs> yep. And we'll take, your, we'll take your remarks and your question as well. And if anybody else wants to signal, put your hand up now so the mic goes at the back next. Yep. From Dennis's, but it, it was it was just listening to Patricia there brought back a memory. I don't know whether you can remember it, Patricia, but in very early days when we were up in Belfast at Madeline's Manukin, and you remember obviously you do uh, that Kevin Winters at that stage worked um, for Peter Madden, and I remember him saying, "If Bloody Sunday happens today, Madden and Manukin." would seek to represent all 20,000 people on the march to sue the government for serious damages, for um, distress, and etc. I mean, you'll know all the legal terminology that, that I don't. And I, I, I'm sure he was right. And so the question I want to ask, and maybe it's an unfair one, is looking back 50 years, how did the... How do the legal representatives of the Bloody Sunday families and whoever at the Witchery Inquiry, how do they fare in the light of 50 years of subsequent experience? Because what's interesting in one respect is no judicial review, no attempt to take it to a higher court, no attempt to overthrow it legally, as far as I'm aware at least. So do you think... Do you think the, 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 the solicitors and the barristers who represented the families and, the, if you like, the victims of Bloody Sunday, do you think they, looking back, feel that they were well served? It's a, qu it's a question that, that I have considered over the years because, um, well, I only started practicing in 1992 and met the families then, um, but it, 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 the difficulty for lawyers at that time was it was cold face work, and it was uh, front line, and it was head above the parapet work. Um, the Bloody Sunday families did sue. There were civil actions, which they, they of course, they were settled in 1975 in an ex gratia ba basis. In other words, no responsibility. We take no, um, we you know, we, we we take no part for this. We don't we we don't accept that we did anything wrong, and it was the times with the difficulty, the 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 political backdrop and uh, informed the legal landscape. That's probably the best way I can describe it. Now I'm coming at this from being very inexperienced in 1992. So that was my perception, perception of it. And it only took, and even today, even today, there are a very limited number of uh, lawyers doing what's known as the legacy cohort of work. There, there, there's maybe six firms, 10 firms in, the, in, the, in, in Northern Ireland who, who are dealing with these cases. And you, you have to have a, a very genuine interest in them. They are vocational cases. These are not cases that, 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 that you do because they take a very long time to come to fruition. And 
discovery mechanisms are not great in the civil er claims area. You have to push, push, push. Uh, inquests are better because you have judicial scrutiny and judicial directions, but it is about f you know, using the available mechanisms to, to get what information you can, because this is an information war, you know, and, and the, the families know that from day one. In answer to your question, I'm not sure. I also deal with a lot of uh, cases going back to the Criminal Cases Review Commissions from um, the 1970s and 80s, where people have been most likely wrongfully convicted. Um, uh, but it was, it was a system which was in operation, which was difficult for a handful of lawyers to overcome. I'm not sure that answers your question. And I think maybe that's also a question that the families themselves might, might, might be better fixed to, to, to answer. Some of the legal remedies just weren't available to the judiciary. The BU in its current form didn't exist pre-1985. You know, it was a kind of court invention. So a lot of the legal remedies now and ways of getting into court just simply didn't exist. So I'm not, I'm not in a position to judge the lawyers then, but I'm just saying you can't assume that some of the things that you would expect to have been taken looking at it today weren't actually available to them, to the lawyers at that point. Also, just having sat in other cases where I really wondered at the time, some of them with Madden and Finucane, you know, what this case has got so um, corrupt. So I remember um, uh, one of the cases in Belfast and it was so corrupt and right at the end of the case, um, a whole lot of disclosure hadn't been made by the Crown that meant that you couldn't rerun the trial fairly. And I was sort of saying, should should we be even be participating in this? And actually, everyone took that question really seriously, you know. And but it is really difficult because because there's also a big price to non-participation. So it's fine to say we'll pull the rug out from this and we'll all just not participate. But then it goes ahead, you know. You can't always predict that that will if that closes it down and has everyone say, yes, this was a disastrous idea, fine, then, then that's been a good strategy. But it can also go ahead without saying, well, you had a chance to plead your case and you didn't. So I think it is quite, I think it is quite a difficult strategic decision when you're in the middle of it. What should you, you know, what should you accept and try to get what justice you can and, and what should you not? So it, it's quite difficult to apply hindsight to. So, I, you know, Maybe that sounds like it probably is a bit of a defence of lawyers, to be honest, but um, I think things were very different. You look at a whole lot of cases that went on at that time, even looking at the, the you know, the Trisha Curran case where there was a wrongful conviction of a, actually a Scottish soldier for a lot of years. You know, the whole trial took basis on the basis that there wouldn't be cross-examination of certain people and everybody just seemed to accept that. It, it's extraordinary, really. Um, so there's, you know, it's quite hard to defy the conventions. <coughs> I just wanted to raise one thing about the good people. I think for me what's quite interesting when I was looking at Widgery is some of the sort of surrounding people, you know, it, there, is a, there is a whole constellation that makes the Widgery judgment come together. And I suppose the most notable one and, and maybe one of the interesting ones, and um, I didn't see the testimony later, but, you know, are, were the forensic people so, um, and, and in particular, John Martin, you know, who, um, who in ways uphold a forensic thing. So you think, well, what if you're widgery and you're presented with forensic evidence that says all these people handled firearms, right? Do, you know, can the judge then say, well, well, I, I, that just doesn't sound plausible to me. So there's, there's a whole system that comes into place and I think maybe one of, the th one of the things I think we maybe make a mistake of when we look at what holds these systems in place is we, I I've thought a lot about this and I suppose it was maybe one of the disappointments of the second tribunal, this sort of sense that there wasn't an overarching conspiracy and that, you know, no labelling of the smoking gun. But the more I look at how these things happen, and this is just my own musings, but people don't need to talk to each other. <laughs> They don't need to, I think they don't need to sit and plan and write down and coordinate the conspiracy. You create a sort of way of doing things in which everybody knows 
what part they have to play and plays it. Everybody knows what the cost to them will be of going against the consensus, whether that's the police officer giving evidence um, or saying what happened when he saw his mates pass the collusion over or, or documents literally and guns walk out of Lisburn Road Police Station as the Ombudsman found a couple of weeks ago. Um, Widgery knows what he's to do probably without the fireside chat because it's part of a culture and so sometimes then the legal bits of these things fall apart when we try to say where was the person that had the intent that, that did this? That actually there's a system in place in which people know the part they have to play and play it. Um, and, and it was interesting because I remember reading the section about um, the Jerry Donaghy and the bombs in the second tribunal and then sort of saying, well, how would the police down here have known what to plant here? And I was thinking, well, is that how it works? Or do people just know something bad happened, we're in trouble, we can sort things here? You know, and, and my sense is that often things don't need said. And I look back, one of the things that really struck me when I was reading actually the Bosnian genocide judgment, um, it's quite horrible going back and reading it now, right? So this is about the genocide in Srebrenica. And the judgment in many ways is awful because it finds all these things aren't genocide, but finds this one little bit. Um, but what you see is this horrible tapestry building up two weeks before it, where women are being raped on the street, where everyone's closing down, they're edging the international players out. Everybody in the community is saying, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. They're trying to call in... Um, the peacekeepers are watching it, saying this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Um, but everybody, but, but there's not necessarily one person coordinating and making it happen. It's that, you know, nobody's saying to the soldiers, go out and create this build-up, go out and rape this woman. But they know, that, they know that there's a containment of the population happening. They know what they're meant to do. And they know that if they do it, nothing will, nothing will happen to them and that it's part of what they're almost expected to do. And my sense is that this has happened. So one of the things I wonder is, should we focus on, should we focus more on what enables people to blow the whistle? What enables people to break ranks? Mm -hmm. And there were in all these stories, people who broke ranks, they maybe didn't break ranks at the time, but the, you know, actually Martin did recant the evidence and said, well, actually, I think I got this wrong. Um, something enabled him to do that. What would have enabled him at the time to say, well, I don't believe this, you know, what, maybe he's not a good example, but what, you know, what makes people um, shelter the person from the other side, um, go against the consensus, take on the fact that they may become a pariah in doing that? Because time and time and again, people do that. And it seems to me that we have to enable that. And those are the people that bring the information out sometimes, or those are the people that maybe they can't bring it out, at least document it in a bit of paper that someone like Patricia can spend hours in libraries and eventually find. You know, some of those people maybe didn't even have to take those notes, but some part of them felt it was important. I mean, I don't know, I'm speculating, but um, you know, I do think we don't, we don't focus on the overall structure of the apparatus, and then we don't fo focus on how could we enable people within that apparatus to, to do the right, to be the good man or the good woman in that situation. Because actually down the line, we, we need enough of the people to have dissented out and brought the information out. Um, we have a question at the back, that's gonna be our last one. Uh, and then we're gonna wrap up today's event. And it's, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, it's been amazing to have this uh, panel in front of us today to answer all these questions. So we'll go for a final question. Um, if we could just go back to the legacy bill, um, I know that you said that there will be challenges in the court um, after, but um, I'm just thinking, what could we do now to lobby, um, especially uh, if victims groups were to band together, who would you be targeting um, and what arguments would you make to try and hack away at the legislation and make amendments to it? Okay, so what can, could be done now to challenge the legacy proposals? 
Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll answer. Just, I think, in fact, that NGOs and families have done, have completed already what they can in terms of um, trying to consult with the government, uh, indicating their sort of universal rejection of these proposals, uh, as have, in fact, political parties in Northern Ireland have agreed uh, that, that this is not acceptable. Um, so in terms of what else can be done, that was actually the question I pondered last, last summer and that's why we came up with this advisory judgment um, uh, unusual step, um, which may go nowhere, but we, we shall see. Um, the, in terms of what else can be done at this stage, really it's about educating those who will make that a decision if this comes to fruition. Because here's the difficulty with, with this bill, if it becomes law, the problem will be that the delay, and it may well be that the entire motivation behind this bill is, uh, is delay. The, the delay will cause irretrievable damage to um, the, the, the causes of uh, those who have lost lo uh, loved ones, particularly at the hands of the state. And it may, well, it, will, it may take three years after the introduction of such a bill, closing down all mechanisms, to, um, to, to get to a point where a court, perhaps a Strasbourg court, is actually looking properly and, and coming out with a decision. It will then, uh, during that period of time, one wonders what will be destroyed. Uh, so there's an information question, and um, one wonders about the, the, the deaths of witnesses, because we'll then be 53 years in, or 50, 56 years, uh, in terms of witnesses uh, dying, etc. So it could be the motivation for this bill in and of itself is entirely a delay mechanism to ensure that this, this f nothing comes to fruition. There's no judicial adjudication in relation to these issues, which is going to embarrass the government, or, uh, you know, because really there, th there's no flesh on this uh, command paper. You know, there's, oh, we're going to close this stuff down, we're going to, you know, we're going to deal with the desktop review, but there's no nuts and bolts in, from lo a lawyer's perspective, and um, which is why the courts are cautious about even touching it from a challenge point of view at the minute because you're saying well look where's the bills so there is a, a slight cat and mouse game going on in terms of you know they haven't pu published it yet whilst this litigation was ongoing so I, I in answer to your question i am not sure that victims and relatives of loved ones and ngos can do anything else at this stage uh, bar continuing to lobby parliament to educate and inform parliament and that is uh, difficult to do when there is uh, limited interest in Westminster in relation to what is happening in Northern Ireland. Okay. I'm going to signal at the back there that there's one final, final question. Is that me, Paul? Sorry, Amanda. Yeah, just one, maybe to finish on one optimistic note. I mean, they have been delayed in their legislation, and at this point in time, it's highly unlikely that there will be any legislation before at least this time next year. Because the, only, the way the legislative calendar works, they have to introduce it after the elections. And what we're being told by anybody that's in the know is that it's very, very unlikely for that to be passed into law before spring of next year, even if they do go ahead. So there's still time for, for families to be getting inquests, investigations, and so on. And more of a reflection there. Thank you very much. Um, if you would like to thank our panel today. Um, thank you. Yep. Yes, that's great. To Christine Bell, uh, Gareth Pierce, Patricia Coyle, and thanks again to the Bloody Sunday Trust and the Pat Finucane Centre for facilitating today's event, and also to all the, the staff at the, at the Playhouse in Derry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.